Parshas Pahaloscha, so you got 136 verses with five mitzvos and some very interesting narratives. It begins, Hashem spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and say to him, when you kindle the lamps, when you light the menorah, towards the face of the menorah shall the seven lamps cast light. The menorah that we have today on Hanukkah has nine candles. It's got eight, four on each side and one in the middle. In the temple, in the tabernacle, there was a menorah with seven branches, three on each side and one in the middle. And here we're told that the three on the right and three on the left have to be directed towards the middle. Rashi tells us so that people should not say that God needs the light. Obviously, if you're going to use the candelabra, the menorah, to to illuminate for you, you want to spread out the light, you want to diffuse the light, and when you have them going towards the middle, it shows that it's not there to provide illumination. So Aaron did so towards the face of the menorah, he kindled the lamps as Hashem had commanded Moses. Rashi asked an interesting question. At the end of last week's parasha, parasha is not so. We read about the gifts, the offerings of the Nisim. When the tabernacle was inaugurated in the beginning of the month of Nisan, almost a year after the Exodus, each one of the tribes, with the exception of the tribe of Levi, each one of the heads of the tribes gave a very generous gift towards the inauguration. Aaron, of course, comes from the tribe of Levi, and therefore he was sad, he was disappointed that his tribe was not represented. And therefore Rashi tells us, Aaron was sad, and Moshe tried to comfort him. Don't worry, you didn't lose out, even though you didn't contribute towards the inauguration of the tabernacle. You have something even better. You have the menorah. And then the Ramban, he questions this particular way of comforting Aaron. After all, there's so many other things that Aaron could have been comforted with. You know, the Kohen, they do the the Ketores, the incense offering, they bring the sacrifices, they do the... The, the meal offerings, they do the worship on Yom Kippur. The high priest enters into the Holy of Holies. Only he does that. No one else does that. They bless the Jewish people. Why specifically would Aaron be comforted with the fact that he lights the menorah? And he tells us a very interesting idea that the menorah that's being referenced over here is not only the menorah of the tabernacle, the seven-branched menorah, but it's also hinting towards an event a thousand years in the future, the Hanukkah miracle that happened with the Hasmoneans when they triumphed over the Syrian Greeks and they too re-inaugurated the temple that was defiled. That was done with the family of the Hasmoneans, with the Maccabees, who were Kohanim, who were direct descendants of Aaron. And therefore, that specifically is the comfort, not just this menorah, but the future menorah that comes together with the future inauguration of the temple. Yes, you may have missed out on the inauguration of the tabernacle, but I'm comforting you, says Moses, says God to Aaron, with the knowledge that your your family, your tribe, is going to be the vanguard of the future inauguration of the temple. Aaron did not alter what he was instructed. And Rashi tells us that this is to give his reward, his merit, the fact that he didn't change it. And this, the idea here is that whenever we're given an instruction, we tend to try to make it our own by maybe adding a little wrinkle, by embellishing a little bit. And here we see a praise of Aaron that he didn't change it one iota. He didn't alter it at all. He didn't add any of his own embellishments, he did it precisely as Hashem instructed Moses and Moses told Aaron. And then we're told a little bit about the menorah itself. It's hammered out of gold. It has the base. It has the various branches, all hammered, hewn out of one piece, one block of gold. The next item in the Parsha is the consecration of the Levites. So the Levites were counted. We were given the exact encampment locations of the Levites, the instructions of which Levite families in charge with the transportation of which parts of the tabernacle. And now they're going to be consecrated to do the work in the temple. Hashem spoke to Moses saying, take the Levites from among the children of Israel and purify them. So how do you purify them? You sprinkle waters of purification over them. This is the waters of the red heifer, which we're going to learn about a little bit later on, which refers to when someone comes into contact with dead people, they have to be purified with the red heifer. 
You put a razor over their entire flesh. You immerse their garments, and that's how they become pure. Why do the Levites need to be sprinkled with the waters of the red heifer? Why do they come in contact with dead people? The answer tells us the Midrash is because when the Jewish people did the sin of the golden calf, Moses called the Levites to help him in getting rid of the sinners. And therefore, the Levites who killed the sinners of the golden calf, they were impure because they had come into contact with the dead bodies, and therefore they had to be purified. They had to wash their clothing, and also they had to shave as an atonement for the firstborns who did the golden calf. Rashi tells us when someone worships the golden calf, it's as if they're like a Metzora. They're dead like the Metzora, and just the Metzora needs to be shaven. So to the Levites who are taking over, who are going to be in atonement for the firstborn, they have to be shaved as well. And what happens to them in their consecration is very similar to what happens to a sacrifice. So the hands of the entire nation are placed upon them, just like a sacrifice is waved, an offering is waved. Aaron actually has to lift and wave the 22,000 Levites. You shall stand the Levites before Aaron for his sons and wave them as a wave offering before Hashem. So shall you separate the Levites from among the children of Israel, and the Levites shall remain mine. So what happens afterwards, thereafter? The Levites shall come to serve at the meeting. You shall purify them. You shall wave them as a wave service. For presented, presented are they to me from among the children of Israel. The Levites are presented, are surely presented for God. Says Rashi, what is this repetition that they are presented, presented twice? So Rashi tells us that there's really two roles that the Levites play in the temple and in the tabernacle. Number one is they are presented for carrying, for transporting the tabernacle. Number two, they are presented for offering song in the temple, in the tabernacle. The Levites every day when they're bringing sacrifices, there's various songs that they sing. And that is one of the roles of the Levites. Interestingly, our sages tell us what is the origin of the Levite songs? What is the backstory of these songs? So our sages tell us that when Moses ascended to heaven to get the Torah, he heard the angels singing songs. And he, when he got back down, he taught those songs to the Levites and those songs were sung in the temple. And the idea, of course, is that the temple is almost a replica of heaven. Heaven, God dwells. And therefore, God dwells, so to speak, in the temple as well. And the role that the humans play is similar to the roles that the angels play in heaven. And therefore, the Levites are singing the song of the angels in the temple, in the tabernacle. And again, a theme that we saw in previous weeks repeats itself over here. For presented, presented are they for me from among the children of Israel. In place of the first issue of every, of every womb, the firstborn of every one of the children of Israel, I have taken them for myself. Again, this idea that we saw previously that the, the firstborn are really supposed to be gods, but because they sinned, that was transferred to the Levites. Why were the firstborn, why were they originally supposed to be gods? When did God acquire, so to speak, the firstborn? For every firstborn of the children of Israel became mine, of man and livestock. On the day I struck every firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified them for myself. Meaning, the firstborn, all the firstborn were supposed to die in Egypt. But God, of course, only killed the Egyptian firstborn and spared and saved the Jewish firstborn, and therefore he acquired them by saving them. My grandfather used to always say that there was a revelation at the time of the Exodus that was manifested in the whole world and in Egypt. And therefore, the people that had the spiritual sensitivities to be able to perceive it, to pick up on it, those people couldn't handle it and died. And firstborn... From a spiritual perspective, they're more spiritually attuned, they're more spiritually acute, and therefore they, the Egyptians at least, they couldn't handle the revelation and they died. Whereas the Jewish firstborn, the same thing should have happened. They, sh- they too should have 
picked up on this revelation and not been able to bottle it up, to absorb it, and they should have died, but God spared them. And consequently, he also acquired them for him. Then, this is verse 19, I assigned the Levites to be, pre- pre- to be presented to Aaron and his sons from among the children of Israel to perform the service of the children of Israel at the tenth of meeting and to provide atonement for the children of Israel so that there will not be a plague among the children of Israel when the children of Israel approach the sanctuary. So five times in this verse does it say the children of Israel. And Rashi tells us that this informs us that the Almighty loves us. He keeps on repeating our name, the children of Israel, the children of Israel, to show how much he loves us. And Rashi also tells us that if you count, it's five times it says the children of Israel in this verse, and that corresponds to the five books of the Pentateuch, to the five books of the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So the five references for the Jewish nation in this verse corresponds to the five books of the Torah. What's the idea behind that? The idea is that, you know, the Torah is five books, it's not six, and it's not four. There's a specific completion, a stature of Torah that is brought when you have all five. And parallel to this, we have, uh, we're told in Jewish sources, that the human soul is comprised of five parts called the Nefesh, the Ruach, the Neshama, the Chaya, and the Yechida. And it seems like that these two are parallel to each other. Just like the Torah, God's manifestation of his will in the world, is complete with all five books, so to the Jewish nation, they embody, they are the personification, they represent the Jewish soul that's complete, all five parts of that soul being perfected and being purified. So indeed, the Levites did it precisely as they were told. They were waved, they purified themselves, they shaved their hair, they provided the atonement sacrifices, and finally they are ready to do their worship in the tabernacle. And then we read about what age they begin to do their work. Hashem spoke to Moses saying, This shall apply to the Levites from 25 years of age and up, he shall join the legion of the service of the tenth of meeting. From 50 years and up, he has to withdraw. He has a mandatory retirement age of 50. Now, it's interesting. Rashi tells us that elsewhere we were told that the Levites, they start their work in the temple, in the tabernacle, at the age of 30. And here we see that's the age of 25. How are those two dates reconciled? So Rashi tells us that from the age of 25 – they start studying the laws of the tabernacle and the temple. And for five years, they study as an apprentice. And once they are 30, they graduate and they are ready to actually do the work. And Rashi adds, from this we learn that if someone doesn't study successfully for five years, then, you know, after five years of study, if you're not able to do it, you're probably never going to see success. At the age of 50, that's the mandatory retirement age, and that Rashi tells us that's only for carrying for the transportation, but the other roles that the Levites play, like like singing, even uh, loading up the cargo onto the wagons, onto the oxen, opening the doors, being an usher in the temple and tabernacle, those they could still do, but they cannot actually do the manual labor. That's from the age of 30 to the age of 50. Now we're going to go back to the narrative parts of of this Parsha, and there's a lot of it. Uh, So chapter 9 begins, Hashem spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, in the second year from their exodus from the land of Egypt, in the first month saying. So first of all, Rashi tells us that the beginning of the book began with the second month of the second year. And this is the first month of the second year. So chapter 1 of Numbers actually happened chronologically after chapter 9 of the book of Numbers. So it's obviously not written in chronological order. And Rashi tells us, and quoting from the Talmud, that this is source, this is the evidence, this is incontrovertible evidence, the Torah is not necessarily written in chronological order. That said, Rashi asks the question, 
So why indeed was the chronology altered? So yes, the Torah is not necessarily in chronological order, but it would only depart from the chronology if there is a need for it. There doesn't seem to be a good reason why we can't start the book with this narrative of chapter 9 of the Pesach offering that they did in the wilderness. So Rashi tells us that the reason why this was put at the middle of the book in chapter 9 is to tell you that this Pesach offering that's going to be detailed in chapter 9, that was the only Pesach offering, that was the only pastoral sacrifice that was brought for the duration of the Jewish people's time in the wilderness. They're going to be there for 40 years, and only once did they bring a Pesach offering. Why? Because they weren't ready for it. It wasn't, they weren't commanded in it. They weren't at the stature of being worthy of having the Pesach offering. And therefore, because this is something which is a little bit shameful, that they did not fulfill the sacrifice, the mandatory sacrifice for the subsequent 39 years in the wilderness. Therefore, it's kind of buried. It's hidden. It's not at the very beginning of the book. It is in the middle in chapter 9. So, Hashem's what the Moses is saying. The children of Israel shall make the Pesach offering at its point in time. On the 14th day of the month, in the afternoon, they should make it in its point, in its appointed time, according to all the decrees and laws, shall you make it. So Moshe goes up to the Jewish people, and he tells them to bring the Pesach offering, and indeed, the Jewish people did it. Now, Rashi tells us a very valuable lesson here in verse 4, that Moshe told the Jewish people this information, but after all, elsewhere in the book of Exodus, Moshe had already told them the laws of the Pesach offering. Why does he repeat it now? And Rashi tells us a very valuable insight that even though the laws of of the Exodus, of Pesach, were told to the Jewish people in, in the book of Exodus and subsequently in the book of Leviticus, when it's Pesach time, when it's timely, when it's topical, when it's pertinent, then you repeat it to them again. Even though someone knows something ahead of time, when it, the time for that to actually be actually be done, when that time arrives, it's important for that to be to, for it to be repeated, so that way they are aware of it at, at the time of of action. Verse six tells us that there were some people who were contaminated by a human corpse and could not make the Pesach offering on that day. So there were people that were disqualified from being the sacrifice because they had come into contact with dead people. And they came to Moses and they say, you know, we're contaminated and there's only one time when you can bring the Pesach offering the day before Pesach, the 14th day of the month of Nisan. Why should we lose out? Why should we not have the opportunity to be able to offer the sacrifice? Can there be some sort of makeup date, a rain check for them to make the Pesach offering once they have become Purify. The Talmud offers three possible answers as to who these people were. According to one, these were the people that had lifted, they were the, the bearers of the beer of Joseph. When the Jewish people left Egypt, they took the bones of Joseph that was buried or temporarily buried in the Nile. And there was people who were assigned with carrying it. And because they're carrying the dead body of Joseph, they have become contaminated. And therefore, they say, it's not, our, it's not our fault, we're doing a mitzvah to hold the coffin of Joseph. Why should we lose out? That's according to the first opinion of the Talmud. The second opinion is that these were Mishael and el These are the cousins of Nadav and Avihu, the deceased sons of Aaron. They had to deal with burial of the body of their cousins, and therefore they became contaminated. But again, not as a result of some sort of sin. Rather, they were doing a mitzvah. And finally, a third opinion was that these people were dealing with a mace mitzvah, meaning a body that had no one to bury it, and that's how they became contaminated. Regardless, the people who became contaminated was not because of a sin, quite the contrary, is because of a mitzvah, and they approached Moses and asked for guidance, is there anything that we could do? And Moses tells them, I don't know, you stay here and let me go ask God. So there's a few things here we find out in Rashi. First of all, we find out that really the law of the backup Pesach, the Pesach Sheni, the second Pesach, the makeup date for Pesach really was supposed to be told anyhow. But because these people were righteous, therefore there is merit 
that a law is told in honor or as prompted by those seeking holiness. Because these people wanted to be holy, they wanted to fulfill the mitzvah, therefore the Torah attributes this story and this law to them. First idea. Second idea, Rashi points out that Moses tells him, I don't know, let me go ask God. And Rashi observes that this is like a student who is assured that they'll get the answer from their rabbi, from their teacher. And Rashi tells us, Ashrei Yelud Isha Shekach Muftach. Praiseworthy is someone born to a woman who is so promised that whenever he wants, he's able to request an audience with God and get the answer. In addition, our sages tell us that a wise person is not scared of saying, I don't know. And who is the poster child for that? Who is the paragon of that? Moses, the greatest sage, the greatest scholar, the greatest prophet. What does he say? I don't know. Let me ask God. And God responds, speak to the children of Israel, saying, if any man who becomes contaminated through human corpse or on a distant road, so either someone became contaminated or they're very distant and they can't come to the temple or to the tabernacle to do the sacrifice on Pesach, whether now or in future generations, he has an opportunity to make the Pesach offering in the second month on the 14th day, so exactly a month after the first day, which is the 14th day of the first month, it's the 14th day of the second month, that's the makeup date, that is the second Pesach with matzos and bitter herbs, shall they eat it. They, they make a replica. It's not quite Pesach, you could still have chametz, you could still have leavened bread, but still you eat matzah as well and the laws of the Pesach offering apply to that as well. But a man who is pure, and was not on the road. So someone who was negligent, someone had no excuse to miss the Pesach offering, someone like that, and he refrains from making the Pesach offering, that soul shall be cut off from his people, for he had not offered Hashem's offering in its appointed time. That man will bear his sin. So if someone has an excuse, they're, they're far away, they're out of town, they became contaminated, and therefore they couldn't bring the sacrifice, you have the makeup date, Someone has no excuse, that's a terrible sin, that soul will bear a sin, and that soul will be cut off from the Jewish people. And then the narrative circles back to the traveling of the Jewish people. We talked already about the flags and the encampments where each tribe was encamped in relation to the rest of the tribes, in relation to the tribe of Levite that was surrounding the tabernacle right in the middle. And then we read about how they actually would travel. On the day the tabernacle was set up, the cloud covered the tabernacle. That was a tent for the testimony. So once the tabernacle is set up, there's a cloud hovering over the tabernacle. And that cloud would indicate when it's time to move. So it would always be, verse 16, the cloud would cover it and an appearance of fire at night. So by day there's a cloud, by night there's a fire. And whenever the cloud was lifted from atop the tent, whenever the cloud departed from the tabernacle, afterwards the children of Israel would journey and the place where the cloud would rest, there the children of Israel would encamp. So how do the people know when it's time to move? You watch the cloud. The cloud is normally hovering over the tabernacle. When it lifts up and it moves, now you know it's time for you to move. So it describes exactly how it would, would move. Uh, where would it go and how long would it travel for and where would it rest? According to the word of God, would the children of Israel journey? And according to the word of God, they wouldn't camp. So they were just totally subject to the will of God as manifested by the clouds. All the days that the cloud would rest upon the tabernacle, they wouldn't camp. When the cloud lingered upon the tab- tabernacle for many days, the, Ju- the children of Israel would maintain the charge of Hashem and would not journey. So they following the instructions. Sometimes, this is again verse 20. The cloud will be upon the tabernacle for a number of days. According to the word of Hashem, would they encamp? And according to the word of Hashem, would they journey? And sometimes the cloud will remain from evening until morning, and the cloud will be lifted in the morning, and they would journey. Or for a day and a night, and the cloud will be lifted, and they would journey. Or for two days, or a month, or a year, when the cloud will linger over the tabernacle, resting upon it, the children of Israel would encamp and not journey. And when it was lifted, they would journey. According to the word of Hashem, they would camp. According to the word of Hashem, they would journey. The charge of Hashem 
with a safeguard according to the word of Hashem through Moses. So it's a very detailed description of the different types of encampments, how long they would stay in every place. And the Ramban and all the other commentaries, they tell us that this is really telling us the merit, the righteousness of, of the nation. The cloud didn't seem to have a pre-programmed schedule. You couldn't look at your watch or look at your calendar to find out when's the next time to move. You just have to follow it and it would be erratic. It would be unpredictable. There would be short stops. There would be long stops. It would stop in good places. It would stop in bad places. And what happens when you get to an unfavorable location and you kind of have to stay there as long as the cloud stays there? And sometimes you would travel nonstop for many days. And sometimes you would finally settle down and you think it's time to pitch your tent. It's time to settle down. We're here for a while. We traveled for so long. Now it's time to rest. And you stay the night there. And in the morning, it's time to move again. And sometimes you would rest for a whole day and a night, and now you assume for sure it's time to unpack. We're going to be here for a while. And then the very next morning, you again have to pick up and travel. And you don't have time to prepare, and you don't have time to bring provisions. The clouds up, the trumpets that we'll meet at the beginning of next chapter, of chapter 10, they start blaring, time to get up, time to travel. And the commentaries add that not only were they sometimes in unfavorable locations from a physical perspective. Sometimes they were in unfavorable locations for a spiritual perspective. And again, to sing the praise of the Jewish people, they obeyed God's instructions. They did not travel on their own. They followed how God wanted them to go, as indicated by the clouds and the pillar of fire. And every year we travel to Canada. And I was thinking, you know, imagine traveling to Canada and not knowing when to pack, when to unpack, when we're getting out, when we're settling down. This year I said to my wife, I said, this year we're going to figure out ahead of time where we're going to stop exactly along the way, so the drive will be more predictable. We'll know how much to drive each day and where to stop, and we have to try to find a hotel along the way. It's just easier. The more information you know ahead of time, the more you could be prepared, and the more you could be calm during the journey. And here we see the merit of the Jewish people Everything done with complete, total reliance on God, where we go, where we stop, how long we stop for, how long we travel for. And everything here is trying to formulate the nation, to, to, to repurpose, to, to reframe the nation, to develop complete and total reliance on God. So chapter 10 begins, Hashem spoke to Moses saying, make for yourself two silver trumpets, make them hammered out. And they'll be yours when you summon the assembly and you cause the camps to journey. What does it mean, make for yourself? So Rashi gives us three takeaways. Number one, they're there for your honor. You're like a king, and just like when a king walks in, they they blow trumpets. When you're around, they're going to blow trumpets. Number two, what does it mean, make for yourself? You have to pay for it. Number three, only you could use it. No one else could use it. That doesn't mean that Moshe himself had to blow it, but means these were Moshe's trumpets that were used during his reign. What would they use the trumpets for? So when they had to call the nation, gather the nation together, make a convention, everyone, Moses, Moshe is speaking to us, everyone got gathered together, they would blow the trumpets. When Moses wanted to speak to just the heads of the Sanhedrin, to just the leaders, to just the princes, there was a different kind of blast that he blew with those trumpets and that got everyone's attentions. When when they had to move, they would also use it to indicate time to move. When there was war, and later on we read, during sacrifices on festivals and important days, but really every day, every time there were sacrifices, like we said, there was singing by the Levites, it was also the blowing of the trumpets every day with those sacrifices. The Ramban, he talks a little bit over here in verse 6 about the walls of Jericho that fell with the blast of the shofar. And there's a little bit of an insight that my grandfather used to always tell us that the shofar, the power of the shofar is that it breaks down barriers. So just like you have a barrier separating the city of Jericho from the rest of the world, the shofar, the power of the shofar is to break down those barriers barriers. And similarly, Rosh Hashanah Kippur on the festivals of the High Holy Days, we blow the shofar because the shofar is 
there to break down the barriers that we have erected between us and God via our sins. The sins create a barrier between us and God and comes on the chauffeur together with all the other things that we do on the high holy days and those barriers are blown away. And finally, in verse 11 of chapter 10, it's time for the nation to move. It was in the second year, in the second month, on the 20th of the month, the cloud was lifted from upon the tabernacle of the testimony. The children of Israel journeyed on their journeys from the wilderness of Sinai, and the cloud rested in the wilderness of Paran. They journeyed for the first time at the bidding of Hashem through Moses, and it begins to list the order of the journey, first the tribe of Judah, and then, of course, the tribe of Zebulon and Yisachar, and the tabernacle, all the processes, all the protocols that were outlined earlier, they indeed fulfilled it in the first time that they broke camp and they began to move. They've been at Sinai, at the mountain of Sinai, 10 days shy of the year. It's time to disassemble everything, to pack and to begin the travel. And it talks about all the various uh, tribes, with the orders that they went and who the heads of the tribes were. And then we read about the tribe of Dan, the rear guard. Rashi tells us very interesting. Why was the tribe of Dan the rear guard? It gives us a variety of answers. He tells us, and one of the answers is that the tribe of Dan, they were the lost and found. And therefore, they would go at the end, and anything that anyone dropped, they would scoop it up, and they would have a uh, lost and found to be able to connect the owners to their lost items. And he gives us also two opinions as to the formation. According to one opinion, it was a botch-like formation. Alternatively, it was a column formation. So the whole nation began to travel, and we read about Jethro. Jethro, of course, has been together with the Jewish people for the better part of a year. Again, it's a disagreement in the commentaries. Did Jethro arrive before the Sinai experience, or did he arrive after the Sinai experience? But he's been with the nation for about a year now, and he wants to go back to his home. And Moses tries to encourage him to join the nation. Moses says to Chovev, the son of Reuel, the Midianite, the father of Moses, we're journeying to the land of Israel, and come with us, and we'll treat you well, just as Hashem had spoken, good for the Jewish people, we're going to give you some of that goodness. And Yisro refuses, I shall not go, only to my land and to my family shall I go. So Moses is trying to encourage his father-in-law to join them, and he's resisting. Now, incidentally, Rashi tells us that the name of Jethro, as it appears over here, it's Chovev, it's Reuel, he's not being called Jethro. And Rashi tells us that Jethro actually has seven different names, and therefore he is called by different names at different places in the in the Torah. Why? So our sages tell us that a name is the actualization of someone's inherent potential. And therefore, when Jethro has seven names, that in effect is telling us that Jethro is very accomplished. He's accomplished in all these seven different areas. In fact, the Talmud tells us that Moses has ten names. And we see throughout the whole Torah the concept of names and names being changed. Abraham's name is changed. Joshua's name is going to be changed in next week's Parsha. Uh, Sarah's name was changed. And the idea being that, that the name is symbolic of someone's potential and someone's accomplishments, and therefore someone's name really is indicative, not just of, of an excuse of how we call them, but actually a, a reflection of who they really are. There is a little bit of a terrifying Kabbalistic idea that after someone dies and someone who has not accomplished their potential in life, angels come and they attack him with ropes of metal asking him, what's your name? Which is a code name, which is a euphemism for what are your accomplishments? If you have not accomplished what the Almighty placed you on this earth to accomplish, these angels are going to attack you. Kind of terrifying indeed. So Moses is trying to convince Jethro to come and he tells him, we're about to enter the land of Israel. And Rashi points out 
that the understanding at this point is they've been at Sinai for a year. Now it's time to enter the land and they're really on the doorstep of, of Canaan, of the land of Israel, and they're going to enter. Subsequently, there's going to be sins. That's going to cause the Jewish nation to spend a lot longer, a lot more time in the wilderness. But the understanding right now is that we're about to enter. And Moses, of course, never entered the land of Israel. But that's because of a decree that happened later. So Moses is including himself in the nation. We all are about to enter because at this time we're all about to enter and it's all about to happen in the very near future. And Jethro is resisting. He doesn't want to join. And Moses tries to convince him, don't forsake us. You know our encampments. You'll, you're going to be our eyes. Rashi tells us various interpretations. What does it mean you're going to be our eyes? Either we love you like we love our pupils, the pupils of our eyes. Alternatively, you're going to be our counsel. You're going to provide guidance and advice. When we have a question, you're going to be our visionary to give us the answer. They journeyed from the mountain of Hashem three days distance, and the Ark of the Covenant of Hashem journeyed before them for a three days distance to search for a resting place. The cloud of Hashem was over them by day when they journeyed from the camp. So a few things. First of all, Rashi tells us that this Ark is not the Ark made by Betzal, not the Ark that was kept in the Holy of Holies. There was a second Ark, a scouting Ark, that was looking for a place for the Jewish people and traveled ahead of them. But it's not the ark that was in the Holy of Holies. And we'll hear more about that ark in Deuteronomy. The Rashi points out in verse 34 that in the entire chapter, it talks about the cloud seven times. And that's to hint that there's actually seven different clouds. There was one cloud on each side. They were enveloped by clouds like a cube. So one to the right, one to the left, one in front, one in back. So all four directions. One above them, one below them. That's six. And then there's one ahead that was lowering the mountains, raising the valleys, so making the land smooth, and also killing any snakes or scorpions that could have presented a danger to the Jewish people as they are traveling. And when the ark would journey, Moses would say, Arise, Hashem, and let your foes be scattered. Let those who hate you flee from before you. And when arrested, he would say, Reside tranquilly, O Hashem, among the myriad thousands of Israel. So there's something very unusual. If you look at these verses, verses 35 and 36, if you look at it in a Torah scroll or in a Hebrew Torah, Chumash, a book, you'll notice that there is uh, upside-down nuns separating these two verses from the verses that preceded it and the ones that follow it. And the Talmud even goes on to suggest that this is its own book. This is like an an interruption between what happened prior and what happened subsequently. There's like a break. There's like an intermission almost. Rashi tells us that it makes these, these signs, these notations before and afterwards to tell you that this is really not the place where these two sentences belong, what Moses would say before the, as the ark would journey, and what he would say as it rested. Really, it should have been together with the flag narrative. So why is it written over here, says Rashi, to separate between one punishment and another punishment, between one sin and another sin. So we, we just read here about the description of them leaving Sinai, leaving Mount Sinai, That, says Rashi, was a sin, according from the Talmud, because they left Mount Sinai joyously as a child escapes from the house of learning, escapes from school. And therefore, in order to prevent a a litany, a string of sins, to have three consecutive sins slash missteps, and maybe even to be branded as a helpless sinner, to prevent that, there's this break in the middle to stop the flow of, of bad events, to interrupt it with this, these upside down nuns, this, uh, these two verses that are positive verses. So even though they're leaving from Sinai, and if you were to ask them, in all likelihood, they would say, Oh, we're so sad to leave Sinai. We have such 
w- wonderful fond memories here, still the Torah reveals to us that there was something within them, maybe even something in their unconscious, that was delighted, and therefore that constitutes a sin and a punishment. And therefore we need to have a break. Now chapter 11 begins with the people complaining. The people took to seek complaints. It was evil in the ears of Hashem, and Hashem heard, and his wrath flared, and a fire of Hashem burned against them, and it consumed at the edge of the camp. The people cried out to Moses. Moses prayed to Hashem, and the fire died down. He named the place Tavera, for the fire of Hashem burned against them. So the people are tired, they're weary, and they start complaining. We're traveling too fast. Let's slow down. Three days of traveling. I'm so tired. I'm so weary. And they didn't realize, Rashi tells us, that the Almighty was doing it for their benefit. It was a gift so that they could enter the land immediately. And therefore, because they complained, the Almighty struck down against them and consumed some of the people at the edge of the camp. There's two opinions here in Rashi. Does that mean that these are the rabble-rousers? These are the mixed multitude? Or are these the leaders? It's not clear from Rashi. So what does Moses do? Right away, he starts to intervene. Rashi tells us, like a king who gets angry at his son, the son requests from the king's close confidant and advisor, please go request forgiveness from my father. This is the second sin. The first sin was they fled from Sinai gleefully like kids escaping school. And here's the second sin. They're complaining on the journey. And then we read about the third sin. The rabble that was among them cultivated a craving. And the children of Israel also wept once more and said, Who will feed us meat? We remember the fish that we ate in Egypt free of charge, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our life is parched. There is nothing. We have nothing to anticipate but the manna. So who's complaining here? Here it's the Erev Rav, the mixed multitude. These are the people that were not biologically Jewish. They aren't descendants of Jacob. They were Egyptians that decided to leave Egypt with the Jewish people. Now, incidentally, what is the origin? What is the backstory of the mixed multitude? Our sages tell us that when Joseph, when he was the viceroy of Egypt, he circumcised the Egyptians who wanted to get food from the coffers of Pharaoh. And there was a sect of Egyptians that were moved by Joseph, and they became like Noahides. They became Egyptians who wanted to behave in a, um, in a high moral fashion, and therefore they secluded themselves, they developed their own community, and when the Jewish people left, they joined the Exodus. And here we see that even though they, they were inspired – even though they decided to leave to join the Jewish people, there was still something corrupt about them. They they had the inspiration, but they didn't have the perseverance. And when things got tough, when they had to travel, right away they started complaining and they started to complain, we don't have enough meat, we just eat manna, we're sick of manna, we want something different, we want the meat, we want the, the melon, the leeks, the onions, the garlic. We remember the fish that we used to eat. They started to have buyer's remorse from joining the Jewish people. Rashi tells us that really this was an empty complaint. Because after all, when the Jewish people and the mixed multitude left with them, they had lots of livestock and sheep that they could have slaughtered if they wanted food. And they just were complaining. That's what they asked for meat. They They had their own means of getting meat. But they just said, we want to complain, so they could found something to complain, and they complained about not having sufficient meat. Now, Rashi tells us, in addition, what does it mean we remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for free? After all, in Egypt, they didn't even give them straw to make bricks. How did they give them fish for free? And the answer, says Rashi, and that's mean they got to eat the fish for free. It means that the consumption of fish was free of any mitzvos. So they're complaining about the manna. And the Torah goes on to tell us that the manna was an amazing food. It would develop the taste and the texture of whatever food you thought of. And these people complaining needlessly look at what they are complaining about. And Moses, he turns to God and says, 
what's going to be with these people? Why have you done evil to your servant? Did I not find favor in your eyes? Why do I have the burden of this entire people upon me? Did I conceive this people? Did I give birth to them? Why do I have to carry them in my bosom? It's too much for me to handle. They want meat. How am I going to have meat for the whole nation? It's too difficult for me to hold them myself, to carry them myself, to tend to them myself, to be their leader myself. Either give me some reinforcements to lead the nation. And if this is how you deal with me, then kill me now if I have found favor in your eyes and let me not see my evil. So God says to Moses, okay, I'm going to give you some help. Gather to me 70 men from the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and its officers. I'm going to alleviate the burden that you have solely on you, and I'm going to appoint the Sanhedrin, the 70 elders, to help you in leading the nation. Now, who are these 70 people? So Rashi tells us that these are the people that were hit by the Egyptians when they were protecting the Jewish people. And therefore, just as the people suffered from the Jewish, for the Jewish nation, so too they should lead the Jewish nation. Now, why are there 70 plus 1, i.e. 71 leaders of the Jewish people? So the Ramban gives us a very interesting and Kabbalistic idea. He tells us that there are 70 nations and there are 70 languages and there are 70 souls that descended down to Egypt and there are 70 angels that surround God's throne. 70 is an all-inclusive number and we have 70 plus 1 as a reference to the Jewish nation, which is the one nation above the 70, that they're distinguished over the other 70 nations. A very deep idea here that we see in the Ramban. So God says, okay, gather these 70 people and we're going to convey prophecy to them. I'm going to enlarge your prophecy. It's going to overflow to them and they're going to be your aides. They're going to help you lead the nation. Even though it seems like if you read the verses that God's going to diminish from Moses' prophecy and hand it off to these other 70 leaders, Rashi tells us that Moses' prophecy did not diminish just like a candle. One candle could light 70 candles and the light, the illumination of the original candle does not diminish. So too, Moses, his stature is not going to be diminished. He is going to give, he's going to overflow prophecy to the other 70 leaders, but his own stature is not going to wane. So that's Moshe now has his help. And then God responds to the people. And he tells them, you're complaining, you don't have enough meat, I'm going to give you so much meat, and let's see how much you actually like it. To the people you shall say, so God tells Moses, go tell the people like this, Prepare yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat, for you have wept in the ears of Hashem, saying, Who will feed us meat? For it was better for us in Egypt, so Hashem will give you meat, and you will eat. You're going to have so much meat, and you're actually going to become nauseated by it. You are desirous of it. Let's see how much you actually like it. And Moses responded to God, This is 600,000 foot soldiers of the nation. And... You're going to give them meat, but how are you going to give a whole nation like this meat that they could eat for a whole month? Now, the problem with this is that Moshe seems to question if God could really do it. And of course, Moses would not be incredulous that God could do miracles. And all the commentaries talk about what exactly is Moshe saying here in verse 21. So the Rashi talks about it at the Ibn Ezra. Ramban address it. The one, one explanation in Rashi here is that God's telling Moses, these people are complaining. And when they complain, they're going to get what they want and they're going to discover that they really don't want it. So when God's promising to give them meat, in fact, he's promising to punish them. And Moshe's question to God is that it's improper to grant a request and then to kill them as a result. And eventually, Hashem says to Moses, is the hand of Hashem limited? Now you will see whether my word comes to pass or not. So some of the commentaries tell us that this, in fact, was not a miracle, or at least not a supernatural miracle. God made this meat arrive in natural ways. Just a lot of it arrived into the camp, as we shall see. 
But before the meat arrives, we have the story of the new prophets, the new 70 leaders that are going to be nominated, they're going to be promoted into becoming leaders of the nation. Moshe gathers them by the tent, and God increases the sphere of the prophecy upon Moses, and then the prophecy rests upon the rest of the 70 men, and they prophesied, and either, according to one opinion, Rashi, they never ceased to prophesy, the prophecy, they retained it forever. According to second reading of Rashi, they, they did it only once, and they didn't do it subsequently. And then there's two people, there's two men who remained in the camp, one named Eldad and one named Medad, and they started prophesying in the camp away from the other 68 leaders, newly minted prophets. And they start prophesying that Moses is going to die and... Joshua is going to bring us into the land of Israel. And people start going crazy. And someone runs to Moses and tells him, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, he is very bothered by this. And he speaks up and says to Moses, my Lord Moses, incarcerate them, according to one opinion. According to the second opinion, Rashi, it doesn't mean to incarcerate them. Rather, make them so busy that they cannot do anything besides for the roles that you appointed for them, and therefore you'll render them incapacitated. So what's going on over here? So Rashi tells us that what happened was as follows. Moses was tasked with finding 70 new prophets. The problem is that there's 12 tribes, and 70 is not divisible by 12. Only 72 is divisible by 12. And therefore, which one of the tribes is volunteering to have only five members of this new council and not six. Of course, none of the tribes are going to volunteer. And therefore, Moses actually nominated 72 potential new prophets, but only 70 of them are going to make the final round. So he gathers or he invites the 72 members to come to the tent of meeting. And then he puts a hat on the hat. Inside the hat, there's 72 pieces of paper on Two of them are blank, and the rest of them, the other 70, it says, Zakin, i.e. Elder. And everyone has to pick out from the hats. Now, Eldad and Medad, they were people who were modest, they were humble, and they assumed that the people who are going to pick out the blank pieces of paper are going to be them. And they didn't want to get embarrassed, and therefore they decided, you know what, we're not joining this ceremony, we're going to stay in the camp. Turns out that two other people picked up the blank sheets of paper, and consequently, Eldon and Medad, who are in the camp, right away become prophets, and they start telling the truth, and that is that Moses is going to die, and Joshua is going to lead the people into the land. And Moses is informed about that, and Joshua is very zealous, and Moses says to him, no, 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 are you being zealous for my sake? If only the whole people could be prophets, I'm actually very happy that Eldon and Medad are prophets. And you know what? I wish I wish the rest of them, the rest of the nation would be prophets too. And then verse 30 of chapter 11, we read about the quail, the meat that was promised. Moses came back to the camp. Him, now he has his 70 elders to help him. A wind came from Hashem and blew the quail from the sea and spread it over the camp. A day's journey in each direction. So a day's journey in each direction around the camp. So it's a staggering amount of quail. And two cubits above the face of the earth. So people don't even need to bend down to get it. There was just an incredible staggering amount of, of quail, of meat for the nation. And people started gathering up all this meat, all this delicious meat. And the person who gathered the least gathered 10 homers of meat, which equals to about a thousand pounds of meat. But ultimately, this led to their destruction. The meat was still between their teeth, not even chewed, when the wrath of Hashem flared against the people, and Hashem struck a very mighty blow against the people, and that place was called Kivros HaTaiva, which literally means the cemetery of lust. These people had Tremendous lust for meat, and that lust indeed killed them.
The Parsha ends with a story of Miriam getting Saras, Miriam, the older sister of Moses and Aaron. Chapter 12, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses regarding the Cushite women he had married, for he had married a Cushite woman. So what's happening over here? Rashi tells us that when these two people, these two prophets, Eldon and Amedah, they started prophesying in the camp, Miriam was standing next to Sipora, Moses' wife. And Sipora said, oh, I feel bad for those prophets, for their wives, because now that they became prophets, they're going to abandon their wives, just like Moses abandoned me. After Sinai, Moses was never together with his wife. And Miriam, she found out about that for the first time, and she says, wait a minute, why is Moses separating from his spouse, and the rest of us were also prophets, how come we don't separate from our significant others? That was her question. Why is Moses any more special than we are? And they said, was it only Moses that Hashem spoke to? Did he not speak to all of us as well? And Hashem heard, now the man Moses was exceedingly humble, more than any person on the face of the earth. So Hashem testifies, so to speak, that Moses was much greater than anyone else, including Miriam and Aaron, his older brother and older sister. And then Hashem said suddenly to Moses, to Aaron, to Miriam, so there's a a three-way prophecy here, you three go out to the tent of meeting. So there's like a sudden prophecy that Moses experiences together with Aaron and with Miriam. Rashi tells us that this is evidence that Moses acted correctly. Why? Because Moses always is speaking to God, and there's no set designated time for him to speak to God, and therefore he has to always be ready for it, he doesn't know ahead of time, and therefore he can't be with his wife, because if he's with his wife, he'll need to prepare himself afterwards to be, to be ready to speak to God, and he never knows when God appears to him. So now it's been proven to everyone that Moses had acted correctly. And then the Torah goes on to detail that Moses' prophecy is qualitatively different than all the other prophets. So God summoned Aaron and Miriam, and God said to them, Hear now my words. If there's prophets, God speaks to them in a vision, via a dream, whereas Moses is different in my entire house. He's the trusted one. Mouth to mouth do I speak to him. So Moses is a very different level of prophecy. He has prophecy that's very clear and a clear vision and not in riddles. At the image of Hashem does he gaze. Why did you not fear to speak against my servant Moses? And after God informed them and rebuked them, only then did he depart from them. And this is a lesson for us, tells us Rashi, that we should not get angry at our friends without telling them why we are angry at them. Now, after God finished speech to them, the cloud departed from the top of the tent, and behold, Miriam is afflicted with Saras. She's like snow, and Aaron turns to Moses and says to them, I beg you, my Lord, don't cast a sin upon us. Pray for your sister Miriam. She's like a corpse. Pray for her. Heal her via your prayer. Rashi tells us that really there was only one solution for Miriam. She was stricken with Tsaras, and normally you have a Kohen who helps process her atonement process, but of course the only Kohen is Aaron, and he's disqualified. And besides for that, there's no other way to do it. So the only way for her to get out of her status is via Moses praying, and indeed Moses cries out to Hashem, and Hashem says, please God, heal her now. And God says, yes, I'll heal her, but she has to remain quarantined for seven days. So Miriam was quarantined out of the camp for seven days, and the people did not journey until Miriam was brought in. Why did the nation wait seven days for Miriam to get healed? She tells us when Moses was a little baby, she, his older sister Miriam, she waited to see what happened to him, and therefore measure for measure, the whole nation waited to see what happened to her, and therefore did not travel for seven days as a repayment, so to speak, for her waiting around to see what happens to Moses. Thus concludes the Parsha. The next Parsha, Parsha Shlach, tells about another grave sin that happened in the wilderness as the Jewish people are about to enter the land of Canaan, the land of Israel.